Doing Spice Wars is a new real-time strategy game with some 4X elements from the creators of Northgard. And as you can see, it's set in a fairly dangerous place. Welcome to my beginner's guide. A huge shout out to Shadow Games who gave me early access and sponsored this video of Doing Spice Wars. Let's begin. In this video, I'm going to teach you my tips and tricks, the things that I found most useful in playing Doing Spice Wars. We're going to start easy and slow, talking houses and selections, and then we'll work our way through everything from research to espionage to expansion and warfare. Choosing a house is a really important decision. This is the faction or the civ that you'll be playing. You could choose Atreides if you wanted to go for more of a peaceful route through diplomacy. You could choose Harkonnen for more of an aggressive position, building up villages fast. The smugglers will do exactly what it sounds like they'll do best. And the Fremen are, of course, really adaptable and great at living in the desert. What's more important, though, is actually once you move through to this next screen here, and in particular for this video on the beginner's guide, I'd like to focus you onto your counsellors. Counsellors will provide you with more nuanced benefits and bonuses. It'll also add a lot of diversity of play as you go through and attempt this game under different houses, different counsellor combinations, etc. But something to note here is that they are also assigned difficulty levels. It doesn't matter who you're choosing. As you go through and hover over them, you can see that they're assigned a difficulty here. Duncan, for example, is easy. I would highly recommend, not just in a beginner's guide, but in general, that you go for the ones that are ranked easy rather than hard to begin with. They're easier to understand, their abilities tend to be more straightforward, and they'll probably more likely result in stronger, more successful outcomes in your playthroughs. Your counsellors can also greatly impact the kind of benefits and play styles that you're going to play through. For example, you could choose the two on the left, here playing as the Fremen for extra intel and authority. Choosing the two on the right instead is much more focused on spice itself, here revealing the position of all spice fields on the map and making your units more powerful, easier to go and take it. Finally, before you jump in and start the game, don't forget to fiddle with the few settings available. The tutorial is really straightforward. It's really a few tool, tool tips along the way that are useful, very helpful. Recommend you leave it on. AI difficulty, you should always play on easy, and this game is a challenge. And finally, for map size, whatever's bearable for you, medium or small, might be a good place to start. Hitting spacebar to pause the game at any time, your first move will be, of course, to try and reach for Spice, this vital resource. You need it to pay off the Imperium or whoever your superior overlord is. It can also be converted for money, essentially. This will fuel your entire expansion and game. Speaking of which, we should quickly address the other yields you'll be vying for. Solari, produced as money, essentially, on your territories or by exchanging Spice. Plascrete will be your main building material, a versatile one at that. You can produce it on all of your outposts, for example. Manpower will fuel the machines that mine or harvest your spice. More importantly, of course, it will also keep your military units well supplied. You need manpower for resources. Finally, you may also need fuel to power your machines. Those are the resources that will help you develop and grow your infrastructures, your outposts or cities, however you want to think about it. Moving along then into this next category, we have water and authority. Water is of course essential to life. Don't let it go to the negative or unrest will lead to rebellion you'll have to put down. You'll also receive some hegemony points, the kind of in-game score that will ultimately reflect your overall power and victory through extra water in some cases. The Fremen are great at doing that. And then finally, authority will let you push and capture territories. Arrakis is a terrifying environment. It's kind of like if you were uplifted and just dropped onto Mars. It's a difficult place to exist, but we need to go out and figure out what's here. So the first thing we should do is send our scout or our ornithopter out and see what we can find. You can put it on auto recon and the auto recon does a great job at plotting out territories and finding discoveries that are really useful. We won't be able to do much to our city, our capital, until we reach 2000 hegemony. So in the early game, it's more about exploration and grabbing nearby territories, particularly those that have this crucial resource, the spice field. As soon as you've found a spice field, your mission or objective should be to take it. That's where the military comes in. 
you should start to recruit some military units, expending mostly just your money and manpower. I'd recommend building at least two troopers and then moving through for one of your ranged units or whatever it may be. These will vary depending on the house that you're playing. Finally, starting to build a second scout unit is very useful. You may not always need it, particularly if you've found a spice right nearby like I've got here, which you should have, but it's useful to have. They can also provide yields by researching things later down the line, so we'll get two of them online and out to explore. We can adjust the game speed at any time up here by left clicking or right clicking up down. Here I can see though, thanks to my scout, that this territory next door, this outpost, has two militia units defending it. Probably means that my two highly trained troopers can take it down. Just to be safe though, I will produce a ranger first. With three units in tow, it's time to go. And unless you're playing as the Fremen, and even if you are, it's still a danger. The desert is a very dangerous place. We have to keep an eye out for giant worms that will come out of the desert and swallow me whole. So I want to try and stay on solid ground like this as much as I can. Here I'm going to initiate the attack and try and take this down. I'm going to move my dude off the sand. There's a top tip. Focus fire on the ranged unit in the back there. We might also bring some extra melee power back to try and clobber it down. This guy will take out this guy easily and the territory will be mine. Once the militia are defeated, it's as simple as taking control. Here we need those two resources I mentioned earlier, water and authority. I have enough of each so I can take control of this territory. I could also choose to loot it for extra gold to push through onto another one, but here we have the most important resource of all, spice. And it's not coming a moment too soon. You can see in 14 in-game days time, I owe the Imperium 80 and I'm currently producing none. The upkeep cost of training an army is relatively large in this game. Generally, your army is a little bit limited by a lot of factors, but mostly it's your command points which are unlocked through the game's developments tree. You can think of this a bit like a tech tree. It's fueled by knowledge. You can go through four completely separate branches, each one favoring a slightly different thing. If I wanted to up my command points, it would be a good idea for me to move through here, where there's things like survival training, ground command, more interested in building up villages and taking them for my own, diplomacy, knowledge, I might be more interested in moving this way. Generally speaking, they do also align somewhat with the house that you're playing or your wider objectives too. I'm focused on building up my villages fast and getting my spice connected early. So I'm gonna go composite materials and probably modular parts after that. But there are loads of different great technologies and developments that you can find here. Large standing armies do come at a great cost, particularly in the early game. So if you've trained a few units, it's a really good idea to make the most of them by taking over more territories. As your scouts head out and automatically research the world, plot out the map for you, you can start to get a feel for the best ones. Obviously spice and territories that have spice are the most important, but we can also look to other resources that will enhance different developments or abilities unlocked or built within an outpost. More on outpost development in a minute, but it's important to note that as my units are standing around and costing me money, I don't have too much to defend at this point. It's a good idea to look around and find a target. Here's one right next door to me. It's got a resource that will provide plus 50% fuel production here. Seems like a good target. I'm going to send in my units. They've been standing here for not too long, so they haven't had a full opportunity to heal to full. But the second bar, the orange bar, their supplies, nice and full. So I can afford to send them out through the desert. They can take a little bit of a beating, move through this way, clearly uh, vastly defeat this militia. You can see the militia's power is 12. My units have around 17. Ranged unit has 16. It's more than good enough. I might want to focus in on the combat a little bit, maybe pluck out a stronger unit Focus fire down on some others like this. Bring this guy back now that the conflict is over and establish my roots here. And I'll continue doing this while I can afford to do so and sustain the expansion, watching my water as I go through, watching my authority as I go through, and crucially, keeping an eye on where the spice is nearby. Money starts to become even more important as you gain control of more villages. Not only money, but the Plascrete, and to a certain extent, things like manpower, fuel cells, and definitely water start to become important. Take a look. 
Here as I move in onto a village I've just taken, you can see there are building slots available. You'll likely get access to around five in total. We have economic improvements, military improvements, and statecraft improvements. These are focused on things like diplomacy and research. The military improvements will help you with manpower to get extra units. Or missile batteries. These are brilliant at defending vital areas. I like to build these in particular where I have spice connected because this will likely be spots where my opponents are going to come to take control of the lands. It can also be useful to try and get them to sort of overlap over multiple places. Here it's not quite possible nearly down by this other village so I'm going to build it on the outskirts there like that. We can also look to develop villages by building militia. These are military units you can't manually control and move around like your military, but they will come out to defend your villages and outposts on your behalf if they get raided by rebels or attacked by opponents. They're much cheaper to build or train than a main unit. Take a look here, it costs $200 and 20 manpower as well as some water to build a trooper, whereas uh, my militia over here are much, much cheaper. You can see it's only 50 currency and 5 manpower. So they're one quarter the price. They also don't cost any water upkeep. Very cheap to build and produce and a great idea to defend particularly territories where we have spice around because my military may not always be within yes, arm's length. Defense aside though, this is really where your Plascrete will come into play. These improvements, these buildings also generally cost money and upkeep. So you also need to be really aware of what you're building and how much it's going to cost you. The most important thing to build of all, and the one takeaway that you really should take home from this video, are refineries. When you capture a territory with spice, you must build a refinery to start harvesting that spice. Building a refinery here will build this uh, unit, and as I speed up through the game, you'll see it start to come through. It's a harvester. It's the third main category of unit, and it's crucial for developing these territories and getting our spice online so that we can start to pay our taxes. Territories without spice could look to support adjacent ones through buildings like the Maintenance Center, which reduces upkeep of both Solari and Plascrete in neighboring territories as well as this one. Could be really useful. You might also look to the wind strength down the bottom of each territory to produce water. Territories with a high wind strength, around say five or six, tend to be better at producing water. So I might want to spend some Plascrete here to build some water generation. Down here it's only at three, it's potentially not as good. The value might come here from Plascrete production itself. I could also look to improvements, see plus 50% fuel generation. In that case it might be a good idea in this territory, first and foremost, to build a fuel cell factory. As I continue to develop my villages you can see that this one here has produced its harvester. It's currently not doing anything. Make sure you check over here regularly. If there's a spinning clock symbol, your harvester is not harvesting any spice. You can recall it at any time if it's at threat from the sandworms, these giant worms that will destroy you. If you're the Freeman, you don't have to worry about that though, but generally you can also just put your spice harvesters onto auto recall. This will automatically recall them if they detect the threat of a giant worm nearby. It's useful to have, but note that they won't automatically redeploy again. So just keep an eye on them. Make sure that they are out and deployed and earning you spice. And then you can head up here to the top left and adjust your spice to Solari trade off accordingly. Here I'm unlikely to make this tax, but if I bang it up to full spice production, you can see I'll absolutely make it now. Producing 19 a day, I'm easily going to make it to the 92 that I need in 21 days time. In fact, I'm already over halfway there. So what I can probably afford to do then is start to trade off. Currently it's one spice for 1.6 Solari. Not bad. I'm going to need a little bit more where that came from just to keep my economy afloat. So I'll focus on that and then I'll focus on building things that are going to generate me more money or save me money. A maintenance center, for example, is a good idea to reduce upkeep. Periodically throughout the game, the land shroud will be in session. You can think of this kind of akin to a world congress, but really at the extreme level. This is a very interesting mechanic that really sets Dune Spice Wars apart. Here you'll particularly benefit if you're playing as the House Atreides, or if you're playing as Harkonnen. 
to a lesser extent, particularly if you're playing as the Fremen, for example. You can spend influence or your overall vote to influence the game in major ways. You can see penalties or benefits can be applied to overall production for everybody. Targeted trade-offs can also be impacted on people using votes. It gets more powerful as you progress through the game, through different chapters of the development of the world as well. It's a powerful way to spend your influence, unlock units, and put really harsh political penalties on your foes. Over on the right hand side of your screen you'll notice these three main panels. The council that we just discussed in the center. On the left, developments, the technology tree essentially in this game, if you want to think about it that way. And then lastly, we have espionage. This is the third main panel here underneath the operations screen. This is an incredibly interesting and detailed selection, but to briefly break it down in this beginner's guide, throughout the course of the game, and this is largely determined by time you will receive agents. You can place these agents in slots to infiltrate enemy houses, gaining you bonuses to different productions and getting better intelligence over them throughout the game. In the middle here, you can see that you can infiltrate other factions that exist. The council, for example, can be infiltrated, generating you more influence and intel. You could choose to infiltrate Chorm instead. Go for money over time. Also, you could put your agents on counterintelligence. Take notes as well that your agents are unique, individual. This one is a psychologist, for example. This agent produces 20% more intel. Uh, little things along the way that could make a difference. Uh, lastly, over here you have your missions screen. These are operations, one-time bonuses that you can queue up by spending intel. The resource that we're going to start generating a lot more of now that we're assigning agents, particularly over into these other houses. Generating intel will let us queue up these sort of one-time actions that are called missions. Uh, poison Reserves, for example, lets you drain and prevent enemy supplies on a territory as a one-time action. Probe Setup grants vision over a territory. This is what we'll spend our intel on that will be unlocked as our agents start to work their magic. Moving through later into the game, there are some really powerful actions that require both agents infiltrating at certain levels within other houses, and also in-game currencies like the Solari or the Intel they get very powerful as they go right the way through, including ultimately assassination attempts on other leaders. But that's getting ahead of ourselves a little bit for this video. Here we've stockpiled plenty of spice to pay our tax that's coming up soon. So I'm just going to convert a little bit more over into money. The alternative, of course, would be to take advantage of another one of Doing Spice Wars' wonderful systems, the trade system. At any point, get up to another house, give them a click, and you can see how much of each resource they have, their willingness or modifier, how valuable they deem it to be. And ultimately this bar in the middle will let us exchange what we want. In this case, I'm probably looking for either Solari or Plascrete to help fuel my expansion. I might look through and find someone who maybe cares a little less about it. Like, for example, Vladimir here doesn't care as much as the others about money. Shift and control, I can change the values and get rid of something that maybe I don't need as much of, like Intel, for example, which is incredibly valued here. 30 Intel for 80 bucks, it's done. And just in the nick of time, because my economy is struggling a little bit. <laughs> Let's take advantage of these units again, now that I have enough water to actually take this place once my units destroy the militia that are defending it, <laughs> we should be good to go. That water, of course, thanks to my other villages. Don't just focus on expansion though, it's not just the other houses you have to fear, it's also the constant threat of sandworms popping out of nowhere, and rebels and militia factions as well, local raiders so to speak. They will absolutely disrupt things that you've already taken, so you will need to have some military on standby, and ideally some militia trained in your territories as well to try and prevent some of this from taking place if you can't afford the missile batteries to help too. And that concludes my beginner's guide here. My entry level tips, my starter tips to get you rolling in Dune Spice Wars. Thanks again to Shido Games for sponsoring me to create this one video. 
Lucky for them, I really like doing Spice Wars and I'm going to keep playing it. So do subscribe if you'd like to see more. I'll be live streaming here on YouTube and Twitch. I'll see you next time.